Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. A warm welcome to our morning worship. We are Kapelvron. We're still trading under the name Kapelvron, uh, but we're at the name of God. We're a group of Bible-centered believers. We're a church together, and we're meeting on the Lord's Day to, to worship the living God. If you've joined us this morning, you're very welcome to be here. Uh, Please do know that afterwards we have tea and coffee served at the back. Please do join us for that. Crash and Sunday school during our time. And also you can see that we've got the the Lord's Supper uh, laid out, broken bread, poured out wine. What we say as a a church family that you're uh, invited to join with us. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to test me that he saved you. We do say as a church, we say baptized believers, believe that baptism is important. But if you're a believer, according to your conscience, please do come and uh, join in this meal as we remember Jesus Christ uh, together. As we prepare to worship God today, we're going to be looking at uh, a verse for the year from the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, But I want us to start here. Psalm 37. Listen to these words. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Should we pray together? Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ in his earthly life trusted in you. He did what is good. Thank you that you kept him safe. Thank you that Jesus delighted himself in you and you gave him the desires of his heart, that he is risen from the dead, that he will see his kingdom endure through all nations and all generations. We thank you, Lord, that you've given Jesus eternal pleasures at your right hand. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus is our king. He reigns over all things for his church. And so we come to you through Jesus. We trust you. We thank you for all your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, that we can say, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus, you've saved us from death and hell and stumbling and tears, that we would walk before you all our lives and one day forever in glory. Lord, we ask you this morning as we gather together, that we would delight ourselves in you, that we would rejoice in the hope that we have in Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would be built up together and that, Lord, that by your spirit, you would be present with us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice. We're going to sing a hymn of rejoicing. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore and we sing the refrain rejoice again i say rejoice so please stand to sing when you hear the music well i just have some announcements uh, for the week to come i wasn't here last sunday we're away on holiday very grateful to Phil for taking that service. Uh, you can't say it enough in January, can, can you? Happy New Year to everybody here and all of yours. Uh, as I said, there's tea and coffee at the end of our time. Please do stay for that and the Lord's Supper laid out also. You need to know that this week, uh, as a church, we normally start January with a week of prayer. So we have a special focus on prayer. As a church, we we want to be faithful in prayer all the year round. We have regular prayer meetings, want to pray for one another and God's work in the world. And it's particularly a joy in January to have a week of extra prayer meetings uh, where we spend time 
uh, together in homes, uh, just calling on God's name and seeking him uh, together in prayer for particular things that are close to our heart uh, as a church. Now, there's no free line whip on coming to all the prayer meetings. In fact, please don't. don't. There's uh, prayer meetings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Monday, half past one at Phil and Kate's house. Uh, Tuesday, half past seven, Anne's house. Then on Wednesday, there's two prayer meetings in the back room here in the Naeth Gopher at half past one and half past seven. Again, on Thursday, Phil and Kate's house at half past seven. And then at the Campbell's, mine and Rachel's house on Friday afternoon at half past one. That's a lot of prayer meetings. You don't have to come to them all. But if you could come to two or one, if you don't normally come to a prayer meeting, there are a couple of evening prayer meetings or three evening prayer meetings that you could come to. Chance to have a cup of tea, spend time with people, but but also to have a time of prayer where we really seek the Lord. If you're not able to come to those meetings, I've sent out uh, an email uh, kind of uh, kind of showing the the topics for prayer. I would encourage you if you can make a one percent increase in in your prayer for the church this week. Maybe you think, ah, oh, I'm walking to the shops, so I take the longer route round and I'll spend some time praying for the church or you think on Wednesday morning I'm putting the washing in the machine I'll make sure I, I uh, I'll make sure I pray as I do that if you could if we could all be praying and seeking God's will together as a church it would be a glorious and a wonderful thing so it's a busy week please do remember as well the open air outreach that takes place on Wednesday in Pacheli and Friday in Porthmadic uh, please do remember that. And also on Thursday, Thursday is a busy day because uh, in the back room of the Naeth Gopher here, we have at nine o'clock the toddlers group starting back again. And uh, at 11 o'clock, the ladies book group reading the last chapter or discussing the last chapter of the book that you've been reading together. Please do know that we are praying for you as a church praying for each one of you. What I do want to say at the start of the year, um, my role in the church, uh, together with Phil and one of the elders, but full-time pastor. So if you have any prayer needs, anything that you want to discuss, any circumstance in life that you need encouragement and help with, I am available to you. So please do get in touch. I just think that's worth saying at the start of the year. I do underline that three times. If there's anything as a church or I can do to help, please do get in touch, come and see me. Well, be joyful always, pray without ceasing. We're going to sing about the wonderful privilege that we have in prayer. Uh, as we do this, we're going to take up our offering to the Lord's work. There's no pressure on any visitors to contribute to this. It's for the Lord's people who regularly gather here to uh, honour the Lord with our gifts and we're going to sing this and rejoice together. We're going to take it to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to invite John Bolger to come up. John is going to lead us together in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have this privilege, Lord, to come before you this morning. And we take great um comfort in the fact that you are a God who hears our every prayer, a, a God who um, rejoices in our prayer, a God who um, brings that prayer to God in a perfect way. We thank you, Lord, for the access that we have to come to you, Lord, with all our concerns, with all our um, um worries and our illnesses and all these things uh, that happen in the world. We live in a very cold world towards this Christian faith, but we thank you. We have a God who, who knows the end from the beginning, and we can be confident that you will, uh, your will will be done on this earth as it already is in heaven. And Lord, we uh, thank you that you are a God who has, out of all the people in this world, undeserving, 
you have chosen us, Lord, and we are so grateful. Not when we were trying to uh, please you or uh, find you, Lord, but when the time was right, when we were apart from you, when we were lost in this world, you came and you spoke your gentle voice and we heard and we believed. You gave us eyes to see and ears to hear the wonderful word. And we pray as uh, Pete uh, preaches this morning, Lord, that you would, um, as, the, as your word says, those who have ears to hear, let us hear. Let us rejoice. Let, we, let, us, we, let us be glad as we are renewed in the spirit through the word of truth, that eternal word, that even though uh, the heavens and the earth will pass away, your word stands forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And oh, God, we are so thankful that we know him, that we've learned to love him. And as we hear his word, may we love him even more. We do pray for people who are sick amongst the congregation. Think of John uh, as he recovers and, and uh, Carol, Lord God. We especially pray, Lord God, for the Frost family. We pray for Rhonda, that you will give her strength. We pray for the family, that they will know the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. We pray too, Lord God, for the children as they go down and that they would learn about the Lord Jesus Christ at a young age. We pray for the local work here in Penryn Diedrith, uh, the mothers and, and toddlers as they meet um, and uh, as they um, uh, get to know uh, people from the community. May you uh, may they uh, hear your word, Lord. May they uh, come to know you as we have done, Lord God. And we do pray, Lord God, especially about the ongoing work um, to uh, get uh, this building, which is uh, taking its time, Lord. We pray that the process might be speeded up. But we're thankful that we have a warm and cozy place in a a stormy day to come into this place under uh, the shadow of the great God Almighty who hears our every word. May we thank you in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> boys and girls, do we have some boys and girls? Yes, we do. Hello, hello. Um, it's Sunday school soon. Something for you to think about. Now, in the service, when you're in Sunday school, we're going to be thinking about Paul writing to a church called the Thessalonians. They're in a place called Thessalonica. And these people have become Christians. And Paul says that he's heard how they've turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So a Christian is someone who's turned to God through Jesus from idols. You think, wow, what's an idol? Well, in the old days, an idol was something that wasn't God, a statue or something that you put in place of God and love that instead of the true God. And a Christian is somebody who's turned from that to the true God. You think, well, does anybody here worship a statue? Probably not. But there's other things we worship. We might say money's great, or football's great, or fame's great, or my family's great, and we hold them above God. Now, anybody have a, do you have a pencil case at school? Do you have a pencil case with lots of lovely stationery in it? Some people do. I knew a girl who loved other people's stationery at school. And when she was at school, when somebody would leave something on the desk, like a rubber or a, a stapler or some glue, when the teacher was talking and everybody wasn't looking, she'd just reach out 
she'd take it and she'd put it in her own pencil case. And she'd take something else and put it in her own pencil case. She'd take it up. She'd put it. It wasn't hers. She'd zip it up in her pencil case and she'd put it in her bag. Then everybody would notice, oh, my rubber's gone. My pencil's gone. And the teacher would say, I know where that, that's gone. And she'd look in the bag and deep in the pencil case, all the hidden stolen things. And do you know, our hearts, we love picking up idols. We love picking things up other than God that we trust in. And we find them and we put them in our hearts and we zip it up and we keep it safe. And we might not look like we've got an idol, but deep down, there's something other than God. It might be my family or what people think about me or my hobby. And I put it above God's. And what God does through the gospel, he calls us to himself in love. When we trust in Jesus and every day as a Christian, when God speaks to us is to unzip our hearts. We find out what we're trusting in instead of him. We're to turn from it and trust in God's. I wonder if that's true of you, if you're a boy or a girl, man or woman, if you've turned from idols to serve the living and true gods. Rejoice, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Before um, we go out, uh, for, well, the boys and girls go out for creche in Sunday school, we're going to sing a song of thanksgiving. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Please stand when you hear the music. If you have a Bible, please turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, just before Paul's letter to Timothy in the New Testament, letter to the Thessalonians. I want to read Paul's final instructions in the letter to the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 28. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I want us this morning to think about verses 16 to 18 of chapter 5. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We have an evening service, five o'clock this evening. We have an evening service on a Sunday. Uh, and before Christmas, we were looking at these verses. Uh, and I wanted to share uh, this passage with you as a, as a whole, as we meet together in the morning. And we quite often, we, every year, we have a church verse for the year. And I think this is a great verse to be a focus verse for us as a church for the year. 
I want to speak to you about duty and delight. I want to speak to you about duty, things that we have a moral obligation to do, things we ought to do. And I want to speak to you about delight, things we are thrilled to do because they bring us joy, things we get to do. And I want to ask each one of you, as a new year starts, what is our duty towards God as individuals and as a church? What are the things this year that you ought to do? And what are the things that you're looking forward to? What are the things you think, oh, I'm so thrilled. I get to do that. It's a whole load of demands on us in our society and culture, things that we're concerned about, cost of living, war in Europe, cultural changes, all kinds of fallout and problems. In all of that, what is our duty towards the God who made us and who is our saviour in Christ? Now, I was a Cub Scout when I was much, much younger with a, a green jumper and I had badges all the way down my arm. I had a scarf with a, a toggle and, and a green hat. I wore gray shorts. I wore socks up to my knees. I had a clean hanky uh, and a 10 pence piece that I took every time and every week. And when you're young, you're very impressionable. And I was made to do this every week. I was made to stand before the Union Jack with a picture on one side of the Queen and a picture on the other side of Lord Baden Powell, founder of the Scout movements. And I had to put my three fingers up like that. I had to put, and I had to say, and I still remember it, I promise to do my best to do my duty towards God and the Queen, to help other people, and to keep the Cub Scout law. And then I would go off and I would go and fight with everybody else <laughs> and get my lovely uniform or, or rotter or do whatever we, we were doing, throwing axes at walls or whatever we were doing uh, that week. And uh, if you'd asked me, I was very, very sincere in, in, in pl pledging to do my best. What is your duty towards God? I would have had no idea. No idea. Um, be nice. Be kind. Go to church. I promise to do my duty to God. Well, what is your duty towards God? No idea. God to me was as distant as the Queen and the Lord Baden Powell, just smiling down. Some old person up there who's morally respectable and wants me to do nice things. No idea. What is your duty towards God? But as a Christian, you can feel like that as well. I should be doing my duty towards God. What is my duty towards God? What should I be doing? God can seem distant, just morally, just approving some old person out there somewhere who wants me to do good things. What is our duty towards God? And these verses are so helpful. They're a summary, not exhaustive, of God's uh, desire, his moral obligations towards his people. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's reminding the young church in Thessalonica, a church he planted through much suffering, through his preaching of the gospel, he's reminding them of some basic instructions for the Christian life, things that he taught them when he was with them. At the end of Paul's letters, very often you get these quick-fire commands. And as is his uh, habit, he gives a triplet, a trio of basic instructions. When you, I think when you start to join the army, you could correct me in the, if I'm wrong if you're in the armed forces, uh, if you've been in the armed forces, you get basic instructions, boot camp training, your basic drills. Here are some of the basic habits of our responsibility towards God as Christians. Paul says he's already shown them how to live to please God. 
And these commands come with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. All three of these commands belong together. Sunday lunch at our house when I grew up, sometimes it would be a, a Viennetta for pudding. Other times it would be um, Neapolitan ice cream. And uh, it would be uh, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Now, I don't know what you do with Neapolitan ice cream, whether in your house there's an argument. I want the strawberry. I want the chocolate. I think the best way is to have all three and scoop horizontally. So they all belong together. So when you get the roll, there's a perfect balance of, of strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. So these commands belong together. You can't say, well, I'm a joyful person, but I'm not a praying person. Or uh, I, I'm going to pray, but not give thanks. They belong together. And look, there's a constancy in these things that are to be in the life of the believers. Always, continually, all circumstances. So what God wants for us is there to be a consistency of these things in our lives. So these are commands that we have an obligation. They are the will of God for us. We ought to do them. And there's to be a consistency of these things. A growing Christian is someone who is consistent in their commitments towards the Lord. So if you were looking for what your duty towards God is this year, you could do a lot worse than look at these commands. Now, Paul elsewhere says the will of God is your holiness and the will of God is your is is your um, good relations with other Christians. So the will of God is more than this. And yet this is a good summary of our responsibilities towards God as believers. Well, let's look at them in turn. What is our duty towards God as Christians? We look at the first one and we have an incredible surprise. Be joyful always. What we ought to do is rejoice. What God commands is our delight. I always thought of it that there was a door that I was to walk through that said duty, things I ought to do. And there was a door that I wanted to walk through, which was delight, things I got to do that I interested in, that made me happy. And I thought that duty was walking away from delight. Isn't it amazing? This is the will of God for you. Rejoice. God wants you to be happy. He wants you to delight in him. Ought to do's with God are get to do's. They are things that bring us joy. God commands our joy. Be joyful always. Now, for the Thessalon Thessalonian believers, this joy was already present in their lives. Paul talks about in chapter 1 how they became Christians in the middle of fierce persecution with a joy that was from the Holy Spirit. So when they turn from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for Jesus who will come again, Jesus who saves us from the wrath to come, you cannot um, turn from sin and hell and death and judgment to salvation through Jesus without knowing a measure of joy. This is wonderful news. And this joy is worked in us by the Holy Spirit. So being a Christian is a wonderful privilege. The angels tell the shepherds, we bring you a good, uh, good news of great joy. This is a great joy that God should love us through Christ, that he should deal completely with the problem of our sin, that she, he should offer eternal life and hope through Jesus. We have continual reasons to rejoice. So when Paul says, be joyful always, he's not saying pretend to be really happy, even if you're not. 
uh, or work up some kind of feeling within yourself. He is saying, rejoice in the gospel, in all the good things God has done for you. So we have the resources to rejoice as Christians by the Holy Spirit. We have that prompting from the Holy Spirit in our lives to delight in God. We have the resources to rejoice. We have the re reasons to rejoice because we're in Christ and we belong to Jesus and he's purchased us forever and that we're right with God. We've got reasons to rejoice and we're required to rejoice. This is our requirement as God's people, as that we rejoice in God and all that he has done for us. It doesn't mean that every circumstance is good. It doesn't mean that we're immune from suffering. It doesn't mean that you don't get days where you wake up and feel like kicking the cat and being rude to everybody because you're so grumpy. We all get days like that. But in every situation through the gospel, a Christian has something to rejoice in. There's to be a constancy of joy in our lives. Tyndale, 1525. He was the man who translated, one of the first people to translate the scriptures into English. He was on the run from English authorities all of his life. He died a martyr's death. This is how he translated the word gospel. Evangelion. What we call the gospel is a Greek word, and it signifies good, merry, glad, and joyful news that makes a man's heart glad and makes him sing, dance, and leap for joy. It's what the gospel is. It's good news, and God requires us to delight in that. It took me ages as a Christian to get my head around this. I thought duty was over here, and I thought joy was over here. What I read here is duty and joy belong together. It is our duty and our discipline to rejoice in God. He wants me to delight in him. That means that joy is a discipline. I need to think every day that there is a time where I purposely give thanks to God and delight in Christ. It's also a reaction that God works in me as I know more of his will to circumstances. Sometimes it's overflowing with emotion. Other times it's not. It's something that we do communally. So we sing not just because we've got wonderful voices and we like to hear each other, but we sing because we're required to show joy and we do show joy. We stir each other up by singing. It's a corporate thing and it's an individual thing. God commands my delights. We live in a world that says, be happy, don't worry, live for yourself, make yourself happy. And as Christians, we're like, we know that's wrong. That kind of hedonism is wrong. But actually, it's not as, as Christians that we don't pursue happiness. We do pursue happiness. We pursue delight in a great God. A Puritan put it like this. Imagine a king came to you and said, look, I want to uh, take you to my gold mine. And here's your work. I want you to go in that gold mine and get as much treasure for yourself. And the harder you work getting treasure for yourself, the more you get to keep, the more happy you will make me and the more delighted I will be. That would be incredible, wouldn't it? And God says, look, here is the gospel and all my son has done for you. I want you to dig deep in the gospel and make yourself happy. Just rejoice in all that Christ has done. And the more you do that, the more happy you will make me. Now, there's other requirements and other duties. We do do things to please God. But delight, rejoicing in God is something that we are commanded to do. Be joyful always. Secondly, pray continually, unceasingly. As God's people, the Thessalonians, they'd seen the example of Paul. They were to pray always. They were to call on the name of God. There was to be a steadfastness, a constancy in prayer. Now, if there's anything that Christians, in my experience, tend to feel guilty about, it's our lack of prayer. We would say, I don't pray enough. 
I should pray more. I should maybe make it to a few more prayer meetings. I should be a bit more, um, I should be a bit more uh, disciplined in my prayer life. And we make a stick to beat ourselves up and we still don't pray. And we should be disciplined in our prayer lives. God wants us to pray. It's a moral obligation. This is God's will. Jesus taught the disciples that they should always pray and never give up. Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, a form of prayer. So these things would be always praying for God's kingdom to come, always praying for forgiveness, God's will to be done in our lives. Prayer is to be a constant part. Yet here's the thing, if we wed prayer to joy and to thankfulness, prayer becomes not just a duty, and it is a duty, but a delight. Not just something we ought to do or have to do, but we get to do. If we know God as our Father through the gospel, if God desires our company and our communion, if all our good comes from God's, we need to be found in prayer. It's like the, uh, the boss of a huge company in London. He works at the top of a skyscraper and he has loads of offices below him. And people come in very nervously to want to make deals with his company. But then somebody comes up in the lift and it's his son who's 12 years old. He's in town, wants to catch him on his lunch break. Does he have time? Of course he has time for his son. There's a relationship that we have a father that we can approach through Christ. The more I see it like that, the more I see as prayer is something I get to do, not something just that I ought to do. What are your responsibilities before God? How's your prayer life going? Do you have time each day that you pray? Do you pray according to what the Bible says you should be praying for? The, the Lord's Prayer is a great place to start. Do you pray for fellow Christians and the church that you attend and are part of? How's it going? There are all kinds of help, all kinds of apps that you can get for prayer life, all kinds of ways. It's better to pray as you can and pray not as you can't. It's better that it's constant rather than you set off saying, I'm going to pray three hours a day and fall on your face and then don't pray for three months. It's better to say, look, five minutes in prayer. I'm going to take myself off. Jesus said, retreat into your private room, a private place where you can pray for your family. Do you pray? Do you receive the responsibility that you have to pray? It's interesting. Prayer is wedded to joy. So as we are praying and seeking God's will, we will find joy. We will rejoice in God. Be joyful always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Paul has shown them how to live. He says to the Thessalonians, he shared his life with them. When they looked at Paul's life, they saw someone who gave thanks in all circumstances. That doesn't mean that every circumstance is good and that we've got to pretend what is happening to me is really good. It means that God as our Father in Christ is sovereign. So it, there is every circumstance, there is something that I can give thanks for. I love this story. Matthew Henry, who in the Puritan times uh, lived in Chester, he wrote a, a multi volume commentary on the Bible that's still used today all over the world. In his diary, one day he had his wallet stolen in town and he records this. Let me be thankful. Thankful when you've had your wallet stolen? Let me be thankful. Firstly, that I was never robbed before. Let me be thankful. Secondly, because although they took my purse, they didn't take my life. Thirdly, because though it was all I had, it wasn't much. Fourthly and finally, let me be thankful because it was I who was robbed, not the one who was doing the robbing. You see, 
The gospel gives us a perspective on the whole of life. There is something in every situation that we can give thanks for. As a church, we're not quite where we want to be at this start of the year. We're waiting for a building to materialize and the, the promise of a building, we're still waiting. But can we give thanks for what we do have? Can we give thanks for each other in every circumstances? Warm, dry place to meet. Can we give thanks that God's word is going out in every situation? Can I find something to thank, be thankful for? So here you get these trio of commands. And what we find is what we ought to do, if we view them in Christ, they're things that we get to do. That duty and delight in God's grace are one. How's your relationship with God? How's your responsibility towards God this year? As a Christian, if you are a Christian in the Lord Jesus, are you looking upwards? Do you say you have a responsibility to delight in him, to pray and to give thanks? Does God have you? Does he have your attention? Does he have your heart? Are you going upwards to God? Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And in this verse, this is the, those words, in Christ Jesus, are where the action is. This is the warm kitchen, if you like, where we receive the grace of God to do these commands. If you're a Christian, you are in Christ. That is your fundamental identity. You are in Christ. You are no longer in Adam, in sin, under the wrath of God. You are in Christ. You've died with Jesus. You've risen with Jesus. And you are in Christ. There's loads of things that the New Testament describes as being in Christ. Grace is in Christ. Eternal life is in Christ. Being part of the church is in Christ. God's will is in Christ. It's not that the will, uh, the will of God, his moral commands, are something enforced on us. They're not have-tos. They come to us in Christ. They're his gracious will for us. We are given his will. It's a wonderful gift. This is God's will for you in Christ. This is the sphere in which you live. A man says to his 18-year-old son, go and rake the leaves. Oh, that's something I ought to do. A man says to his 18-year-old son, drive my sports car I have in the garage. Wow, that's something. I get to do. What a wonderful thing. God says, rejoice, pray. He says, give thanks. Oh, not an ought to do, a get to do. I think you'd be greatly helped in your relationship with God if you saw his commands as get to do's. I get to do this. I get to gather in church. I get to obey his moral commands. I get to pray always. How thrilling. That makes me want to plan time tomorrow morning in my study to pray. Say so 10 minutes, I'm going to do it. I get to do this. It feels awkward. I don't know what to say always. What should I be praying for? But I'll do it and I'll do it again. How's it going with God? Do you see it as a get to do? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And some of you, you're not in Christ Jesus, so you can't do these things. You're like me being a scout. You look at uh, the Queen and the Lord Baden Powell and you think, oh, what is my duty towards God? Oh, I think I'm doing the right things. You're trusting your moral actions, but you don't have a relationship. It hasn't saved you. You're not looking to Christ. Instead of thinking about duty, look at Jesus as the saviour who loves you. Do you know his love, 
Have you trusted him? Start there. What are your responsibilities towards God? And I want to say as a church, it's really important that we get this right. Paul here is talking about the vertical relationship that we have as a church and as individuals with God. That we each and as a church have a relationship and responsibility towards God to seek him, to delight in him, to pray, to give thanks. That is what he wants. Why is that so important? Well, it's so important because church life is so, it's so delicate. There's so many things as a church that we need to get right. Paul puts this trio of commands right in the middle of verse 12 to verse 19 of some responsibilities that the church have towards each other and towards their leaders. So in verse 12, he says, um, you've got to respect your, your leaders who work hard among you. Is that important to res churches respect their leaders? Yes, it is. Then in verse 13 and 14, he wants them to encourage and help each other. So he wants them to be peaceful. He wants them to warn those who are lazy, to encourage the timid, to help the weak. Is that important to help each other as a church? Yeah, it is. We have a responsibility to encourage uh, each other and to rebuke each other as well. Is it important that we're careful about our relationship with outsiders? Yes, it is. And then in verse 19, he talks about the importance that those churches treat prophecy right, that what God says through his words, this is how I would interpret that, that what God says through the preaching of his word, through word gifts used in the church, that they don't just uh, yeah, throw it behind them, but they hold on to what is good, that they test everything. So discernment, is that important? Yes, it is. So they've got all these things they need to do. What is going to be help? What is going to help those things? A rich devotional life towards God, where there's joy and prayer and thanksgiving. Christians get into all kinds of problems relationally in church. There can be all kinds of malfunctions. And very often, what hasn't been helped, what's been neglected, is our devotional life towards God. This year, what is our responsibility towards God? All the decisions that we need to make about leadership, about organization, about church buildings, about relationships which, with each other, will be greatly, greatly helped if we give ourselves in devotion to God. And now, this is not a telling off, because the Thessalonians were already doing this. They were already doing this. And as a church, by and large, I think we're already doing this. But Paul is saying, do this more and more. Rejoice, pray continually, give thanks. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I love the story I was told by an old, wiser preacher about the thief who was converted and went to church for the first time. He'd been stealing and thieving things for years and years. He went to church, and there in the service, the vicar stood up and read the Ten Commandments. And when he read, Thou shalt not steal, the thief stood up and said, Yes! Hallelujah! Because he didn't just read it as a command, he read it as a promise. It wasn't just an ought to, it was I get to. I'm not going to steal anymore. Hallelujah! Wouldn't things change if we saw in our relationship with God that God's commands are ought to's, but by his grace and by his spirit, they're also get to's. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We're going to sing about the grace of God in our lives in Jesus. Uh, yet not I, but through Christ in me. We're going to sing about the gift of grace we have in Christ. And then we'll come to the Lord's table together. Sing.
through the Lord Jesus. All our praying is a praying because of what he has accomplished. And all our giving thanks is ultimately because of what he has done for us. And so when we come to the Lord's uh, table at the start of a new year, it's wonderful to remember Christ and what was suffered. Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overcome the grave. As members of the church here, every year we remind ourselves of a, a member's covenants. So to be a member uh, of the church here at Capel Vron is to be a Christian, is to be someone who is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we make these commitments to each other. And I'm just going to read them through. And, uh, and we, we say we covenant to do this by the grace of God. So these are duties for us, things that we, we have to do. We believe these are what we're commanded to do in Scripture. But they're also joys. So I'm going to read through. In humble reliance on the grace of our divine Saviour, we promise to cultivate the spirit of Christian love, be kind and forbearing towards each other, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, to try to promote each other's spirituality and growth in the Christian life, to sympathize with each other in our difficulties, to seek earnestly the fruit of the spirit in our lives, to use the gifts and talents that God has given us for the building up of the church. We promise to support the elders and officers of the church by praying earnestly, attending services regularly and devoutly, making ourselves useful in the work of the church according to our ability, contributing towards the expenses of the church. We promise also that we will seek to extend the church of Christ by ensuring that the Lord Jesus Christ is honoured by us in our homes, bringing others under the preaching of the gospel, personal witness in our daily lives, helping the efforts made by the church to instruct the rising generation in the neighbourhood, helping to send the gospel to the unconverted. And we say together, we covenant to do this by the grace of God. Amen. And let's remember now, as we come to the Lord's table, the grace of God towards us in the Lord Jesus. Just take a moment to prepare your heart to take, uh, play, uh, to take part in the Lord's Supper, uh, to bring to mind um, things you need to get right with before God. I'll give you a few moments. Apostle Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for this bread together. Father, it is amazing to us that in the night of Jesus' suffering before the cross, that he could give thanks as he broke the bread, knowing himself to be the perfect lamb of God, knowing what would take place, that his body would be broken, that he would take sin upon himself, the wages of sin, upon himself for our sake that Jesus would give thanks Father we thank you for all that this bread means it points us to the, the body of the Lord Jesus it reminds us that through Jesus we are one body together it reminds us of what he did for us on the cross it reminds us of your grace and goodness help us now as we take the bread to look 
to Jesus by faith in his precious name. Amen. Phil, I wonder if you... Before we come and take the cup. Father, we thank you not only for broken bread, but for poured out wine, that Jesus' life was given for us, that he shed his blood. And this blood speaks pardon and peace and forgiveness, that it speaks of that last final banquet that all your people shall attend, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Would you prepare our hearts as we take um, this cup together? In Jesus' name. Amen. As the uh, cup is passed round, please hold it and uh, hold on to it and we'll drink together. In the Christian life, there's many things we haven't done. There's many disciplines we haven't kept or duties we haven't to attend, attended to. But the cross says pardon. Paul says, this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, looking ahead. The cross says pardon, forgiven. And we can look ahead. We can press on towards Christ because of his cross. Should we drink together, look into Jesus? And I wonder if, Robert, you could put the reading that we had, 1 Thessalonians, up, and those verses. <laughs> Sorry, I caught you on the hop. Verse 16. Shall we say these words together? Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.